I'm going to talk about the art of gentle protest and I do a thing called craftivism, which is activism through needlework. But I'm going to run through ten quick ways that you can use craft in activism, but it's all about thread and gentleness through all of it. And also the hope is that after the talk, you might link in this with other, other ideas that doesn't have to involve handicraft work. So it's really just a quick spiel of 10 different ways to get your brains thinking. And if you want more info, I've got a little book, I've got the website, lots of kits, and I've also got a bigger book coming out in October, which explains much more. But what I'm hoping with this talk is you just pick different things to go, actually, when I leave this room and leave this building, what am I physically actively going to do to try and be part of the change I want to see in the world rather than part of the problem? So this is not a passive talk. This is for you to challenge yourself to say, where can I be of use with the skills that I've got, with the context that I'm in, with the contacts that I've got, with the time or resources? Where can I be strategic and effective and see activism as a craft like any other? You could do activism where it's like a chair, like it could be really wobbly, you can't sit on it, it falls apart after a minute, or you can do really strategic, robust activism where it's a very comfortable chair, it lasts a long time, and it is as effective as possible. So do critique this as I go along. Um, next slide is when I'm talking about craft, I'm talking about mostly handicraft. So I'm not just talking about needlework, but you can see it's lots of thread, um, but it's very much about using your hands in a repetitive way. So it's not about machine crafts. I'm not talking about ceramics or woodwork or glasswork or other types of craft. And you'll see through the steps, that the examples that I show you, it's that repetitive action that is a really um, important part of the craft. But like any toolkit, this is a rusty old toolkit that I have to put my crafts in. It's part of the activism toolkit. Craftivism, I see, is just one tool in the toolkit. So craftivism isn't to replace other forms of activism. We should still go on marches when they're effective and strategic. We should still sign petitions online and offline. We should still lobby our MPs. We should still think about what we're consuming and not consuming, how we talk to our friends. And the word craftivism existed before I started doing it, it was a phrase coined in 2003 by a woman called Betsy Greer, who saw that throughout history, there were groups of people that often met in knitting circles. She's a lover of knitting, who would talk about interesting things around make, do and mend, um, come together and bond with each other. So she saw it as a political act to do handicraft. I, as a typical millennial, googled craft and activism when I saw strengths in handicraft that I thought could really fit in with activism and asked if I could use the term because there wasn't any projects I could do or groups I could join um, that were very much focusing on activism and using handicraft as a tool. So not shoehorning a love of craft into activism, which is not helpful, but prioritising what activism needs to be done and where can craft be helpful? Where can it be have a strength and where can it also have a weakness and we shouldn't use craftivism? So this isn't to replace other forms, this is just another tool that I hope you see as part of the toolkit. And the work that I do is a real mix. So I work a lot with different charities in the UK, but also overseas to get them to do more creative activism. I work a lot with different galleries to link in some of their work with social change and get their audiences to think more about social action, but in a way that isn't party political, that isn't too specific on an issue. Sometimes it's quite holistic or more about training people up as an activist rather than issue-led. Um, I teach at different universities and I do things like sit on stage for comedian Josie Long and Stitch and she links in jokes around activism and craft. Secret Cinema, we did the Shawshank Redemption film where we got 5,000 people stitch as prisoners and think about the revolving door problem in the prison system whilst in fully dressed as prisoners to really empathise with why are people in prison, what's the problems going on there, how, do, how can craft be a really good way for rehabilitation. So a very broad range, 
Tatty Divines in there, but I very much focus with my gentle protest approach, focus on where are people that aren't engaged in politics and why are they not engaged in politics and how can I focus on them because we can't do everything. So I focus a lot on introverts, people who are scared of other forms of activism, burnt out activists, and reaching key audiences that sadly are more influential than others. So women's institutes, enormously influential for UK politicians. So I will focus on them much more than maybe a low income area where I'm from at Everton, who aren't that politically influential and who are directly affected. People who aren't directly affected, as soon as they say, I care about this issue, politicians and companies freak out because they think, why should you even know about this? Never mind care. So I target particular audiences and work with different organisations to help them do effective activism in different ways. And next one is a little um, embarrassing thing, but I also have lots of kits and tools online. So I'm really keen again that you're active. So when I talk about stuff, all of our kits have little questions to reflect on, explain the whole objective of each kit, which will be different, which you will see in the 10 points. Um, and all of the kits and tools and support is on our website. So even those people that didn't come to our lovely workshop this morning, you can still be strategic craftivists if you have a look at our stuff. So my background is that little child with a mullet on the corner. <laughs> is me, age three. I grew up in a very low income area in Liverpool called Everton. And this is the front cover of our local newspaper, the Liverpool Echo, which has still got a <coughs> massive readership and um, is quite different to Murdoch's paper. And I grew up in an area, very low income. This, we were saving local social housing from demolition um, to save the local community from having a park built on land that would have made the area more unsafe um, and would have really take broken up generations of families together. My dad's still a local vicar, which is unusual. My mum is now a local politician and cabinet member. And as a three-year-old growing up in the 80s, we worked on lots of local issues around health centres and schools and good housing, as well as global issue around anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. I went when I was eight with my family as my dad's sabbatical to see what was happening on the ground to help campaign against apartheid and to bring these communities together where it was very tense, you know, opening up um, segregation. People on both sides were nervous. It was a new way of working. So there was a lot that I basically, from the age of three onwards, as an introvert and an observer, just soaked up everything about where campaigns worked, where it didn't. With this campaign on social housing, we targeted the wrong person for a few months and quickly realised that we should be targeting a different power holder who made the decisions. We engaged both bishops in Liverpool, Catholic and Protestant, to get us media like this, hence the pulpit power media. We got pro bono work from lawyers to help with the legal issues. We worked with people of all faiths and none. So with any campaigning, strategies ne are needed. Good intentions are not enough. They are a good start. Um, but I also realised that growing up as an activist, becoming a campaigner for different charities, that I, I burnt out straight away. Next slide. When I do this. Next slide, yeah. Um, so I set up the Craftivist Collective as a burnt out activist after I started doing craftivism and people around the world wanted to join in. Obviously couldn't say no, even though I'm an introvert and I prefer being on my own. Um, but everything we do is around this gentle protest. So gentle, I'm talking about not being passive or weak. I'm talking about being really careful with your activism. So highly strategic, looking at every detail possible but also being gentle in terms of being as compassionate as possible with everyone involved. So the perpetrators, the victims, and everyone in between. It's a messy web. And like we learned from Ian, if we just look at things black and white, one, the world is not as beautiful and gorgeous and complicated, but two, it's actually not very effective. So my approach to craftivism is gentle protest, but craftivism, the term that I didn't coin, I always see it as a bit like punk. You've got punk music where you've got the Ramones, the Talking Heads, the Clash, 
The Sex Pistols, they all have completely different sounds, but they're all under that umbrella. So C, craftivism and umbrella, and I do this gentle protest that focuses on activism, so not awareness raising only, not fundraising, <coughs> not donation. So the first thing that I noticed straight away with, with craft was that it slowed me down. And Alex won't mind me saying this, and he's gone anyway, but most activism is very quick. It's urgent. It's quickly, we need to fix this awful solution. You need to quickly sign this petition. You need to quickly go on this march. It's very transactional. It's often very robotic. I was telling people, I was pushed in one of my jobs to get as many signatures as possible from people. So as soon as people asked for more information and wanted a thoughtful conversation about why they should sign a petition on climate justice um, and not look at their consumerism or other things. Instead of thinking, what a great way to have deep engagement, I thought, crap, I'm running out of time and I've been told I've got to get all of these petitions signed. And it jolted me massively. And I thought, where in the activism toolkit is there a tool to do slow activism? And slow activism is, again, not about being sluggish, but it's about if we're angry about an issue, if we just act out on our anger straight away, we have to come up with the worst decisions ever. If we're angry, we shout things that we regret. We create divisions rather than critical friendships. We don't think strategically at all. We're very blinkered on what we think. We're not thinking holistically or strategically. So to have something that helps us tackle our anxiety, our feeling overwhelmed and frozen, or feeling like we've got to get out there and just scream to feel like we're doing something, I use craft work and handicraft to slow people down because you cannot do repetitive hand stitches fast because you make knots, you make mistakes, you pull thread apart by accident. So it makes you extremely aware of how you might have shaky hands, you might have a tense shoulders. I noticed when doing needlework that I had very shallow breath because I was very anxious about being a burnt out activist and whether actually I couldn't be an activist being an introvert and wanting to reflect before I act. And I didn't want to demonise people, even if they might be a major part of the problem. So it gives you time to reflect to breathe and ultimately be more effective because you can focus you can challenge yourself craft is very comforting so I encourage people not to use that to ignore <laughs> the messy world we're in but use that comfort of craft to ask ourselves uncomfortable questions like am I doing for me it was am I doing too many things rather than doing less better am I actually using my activism to feel like I'm I'm making a difference in the world so I don't have to think too hard about whether I am or not, which I was doing lots of too many things. Am I, like someone said here, um, we need to look at alternatives, you know, am I invest, is the bank that I'm with investing in fracking or is it investing in renewables? So quite big juicy questions that we often don't make time to think about using this tool of craft to discipline ourselves, to use it, and a very comforting tool, we can ask ourselves big questions, which I think is vital in activism, especially in the early days. Second one is I didn't think there was a form of quiet activism. And as an introvert, I'm obviously biased, and I get so overwhelmed by, by loud activism. And a third to a half of the world's population are introverts and it's a spectrum but if we're potentially saying that activism most of it's loud or with people or it's collectivism on your own which can be less engaging and people call it slicktivism or clacktivism clicktivism or slacktivism um, if people if we're only doing loud activism it shuts down introverts it shuts down people who are hypersensitive as well which is a growing thing that people realize that they are hypersensitive so how do we do a form of slow activism well again for me craft was amazing on my own to stop and think but also it meant that i could engage a lot of shy people a lot of introverts they're different often they're um, come together um, a lot of people who are burnt out activists who want to re-engage Lots of people who love craft but might be scared of politics. So you get this really interesting group of people of very diverse political persuasions, 
And what's amazing is not only is it quiet, hence the sign, we do have instrumental music in the background that helps rather than distracts, it helps people think more. But you can see here in Bristol, um, people are talking, it doesn't look like they are, but there's a real nice slow flow. Some people just listen and engage and reflect because that's what some people prefer. People who tend to talk a lot in activism groups, and I've been part of activism groups for decades, often they self-regulate, they realise they're the only one talking or they're talking too much so they slow down. And one of the amazing things about handicraft is you have to, you don't need eye contact to engage with what people are saying. Your hands know what to do but often you look down to check what's happening and that lack of eye contact is incredible gold dust because it creates a safe space for people to listen without having to feel like they've got to react really quickly it takes away the tension of looking at people you disagree with because you can say i'm not sure about that can you tell me a bit more without having to look at them so it naturally creates a, sa a safe space for people to to disagree with each other and conflict with each other but slow down reflect empathize understand and just take that time to go okay well we're in this complicated world where can i fit and be of use where could i if i disagree with what someone's saying how am i why am i feeling angry about that do i need to listen to them more and if i disagree do i need to challenge them more but in a very safe slow gentle way also my little thumb oh yeah um lots of <coughs> protest uh, when you see it outside in public I'm the type of person that even if I totally agree with a protest, if I see someone with a megaphone shouting, even if I agree with them, I tend to be that person that crosses the road and goes somewhere else, because it's very loud. And often we go into fight or flight mode, whatever people are saying, we're like, oh, someone's forcing something on me. We're quite stubborn human beings. We don't always want to be told what to do, even though if we know it's right, if it's from a loved one. So one way of tackling that is I wanted to do some pretty protests, which are purposefully small. So I asked for 10 people or less, so it's not intimidating for people. We make it overly kitsch. Now, I do not dress like this in my normal day-to-day -day wear, but I tend to try and wear yellow, which is a more hopeful colour. And we have bunting up, and we have tea and cake and jam sandwiches. And we will sit outside a particular company that we're campaigning on, or a particular area where the context really relates. So it might be a bank and district, or it might be linked in with climate change in a particular area. And we will sit and stitch something, and we don't tell people what we're doing. We sit and stitch, we have a few flyers around, but we keep it contained so that it's not littering and we're not going against the law. And people come up to us and ask us what we're doing, because it's unusual. We're normally sitting on the pavement, um, so it's not just like a normal picnic. And people say, what are you doing? Because it's quiet. Again, that lack of eye contact is really intriguing for people and less threatening. We will get parents with sleeping babies, which you normally don't attract if you're screaming with a placard um, and a megaphone and we can talk about the issue so with this one we were campaigning about a company um, so we sat outside all of the different retail stores and said we love this company but we're really sad that they don't pay the living wage are you shocked we're shocked so we're going to campaign for them to pay the living wage to their staff so their staff don't need more than one job to be able to live with dignity but it was very positive so it was always focusing on we want a world that's healthy and happy and joyful and this and this is one way that we can campaign to encourage these companies to to make their company even more amazing than it is rather than this company is awful you need to do this um, everything's really bad come and join in this really negative angry campaign which is not attractive to anyone and also you tend to look really tired um, and angry which is not a, a post of what people want to be in general so it's very happy but it's also very sensitive around making sure that we're not having so much fun that those people that we're in solidarity with feel like we're using them there's a real tension there of making sure that it's it's emotionally intelligent and um, but done in a thoughtful gentle way some things that we do, which uh, quite a lot of people have touched on, is inner activism. Again, you think of activism and a lot of it is you people over there need to do this. Um, that company needs to do that. It's all of your fault and we don't look at ourselves. And that's because who wants to look at the problems that we're creating? So that comfort of craft helps us. But also, a lot of religions um, 
quite rightly have objects to remind you of your faith, to remind you of the um, things that the beliefs that you have that you think that you should follow so that you might, if you're a Catholic, you might have, I'm from a very Catholic area, you might have a, a Virgin Mary or certain saints to remind you of different things. Um, you might have a Buddha in your home or just outside. But as activists, what do we have to encourage us to challenge ourselves, to protest ourselves about what do we do, whether we're living intentionally or not? So one activity we do is we stitch a message onto a footprint that we then keep. And it's not telling you exactly what to do, which is very transactional. It's intriguing ourselves as well. So for me, this is what I have in my um, bedroom. And it says, where we journey matters and how we journey matters too, dot, dot, dot. And that's a real challenge for me because I often focus on the goal and say, I want the world to be like this. I want this law to be in place. I want this to happen with companies or I want people to disinvest in that and put it there and then I focus so much on that that I might end up stamping on people to get there so for me this is very personal to say I really need to make sure that I thread my values through everything I do every step that I take am I doing it in an ethical way my journey as my whole life am I leading it in a good way so when I look back on my deathbed I can see that I've been as much as possible part of a solution than a problem but in a sustainable way some people stitch things. I had one student who stitched reading The Guardian and drinking fair trade coffee is not um, the only thing that I can do. And she put it in her living room with other students to see. As a challenge for her, some people it's much more about they struggle with empathy, but it's very much about what you struggle with. So it is not the self-affirmational quote saying, I am wonderful, I am beautiful, I am nice. It's saying, what can we improve on? But let's do it in a beautiful way that encourages rather than demonises ourselves, but does sort of challenge us in a gentle way. Next one is a lot of campaigning that I've done throughout the decades with charities has been shouting at those power holders rather than getting them on board. So we make gifts for power holders. So Marks and Spencers, I worked with an amazing charity called Share Action that does shareholder activism. You buy a share, you go to the AGM, you ask your question in front of hundreds of other shareholders and the media and staff, and you are, you are part of a company um, that has to listen to you because you're a shareholder. But Marks and Spencers, who I love, who most of us, it's a national treasure, um, was not having any meetings with them about implementing the living wage. For three years, they were getting nowhere. And the CEO of Share Action read my very small little book called A Little Book of Craftivism, which is a nice taster. And I made it little specifically to fit in Christmas stockings and be like a light touch for people as a stepping stone. Um, read my little book and contacted me and said, we've tried everything to get this meeting with Marks and Spencers. We want to target Marks and Spencers because for the whole retail sector, they are the most influential retailer. Low-end companies listen to them and see them as a leader. High-end companies also see them as a leader. So if Marks and Spencers become a living wage accredited employer, it has massive ripple effects. So very strategic, but they were getting nowhere. So they gave me five weeks before the AGM, tiny budget, and said, what can you do? So I thought, all right, if, they're not, if the CEO is ignoring them, who's above the CEO? Which people often forget, there's always someone above that person, and there's always people that influence them, but they might be a little bit left field. And there's 14 board members who are at the AGM, and they have final say over the CEO. So if they agree with something, it has a massive impact. So I got... 14 craftivists from across the UK. We also engaged five of the top chief financial officers of their, the biggest investment companies in Marks and Spencers because I thought if the board members don't listen, they will freak out if the chief investment officers of their biggest shares says, why aren't you implementing the living wage? And also, we contacted five of those celebrity models they used to have, like Emma Thompson and Doreen Lawrence, and made five hankies for them. So I had 24 craftivists. And I targeted craftivists that looked like or were Marks and Spencer's customers. Because who are Marks and Spencer's going to listen to? Their customers. So there was no point me targeting... Sadly, I'm going to generalise, but I think you'll understand, you know, 14-year-old boys in black hoodies who don't shop in Marks and Spencers. So again, trying to always put myself in 
the power holder shoes of what would I listen to and how would I listen to them. We googled everything about our personal board member or the other hanky receivers and we looked at what colours they wear. We looked on LinkedIn at where they used to work, at what hobbies they have, where they volunteer. And we made them handkerchiefs on Marks and Spencer's board handkerchiefs to show that we were customers and not boycotting them. We made them bespoke, timeless handkerchiefs, so not about the living wage, to say don't blow it use your power for good. So it says, please don't blow your opportunity to support life-changing decisions through m and And then I asked everyone to look for a quote that they thought would resonate with their hanky receiver, their gift receiver. Um, so that when they receive the gift, it's not about what the maker thinks and whether the maker likes it, but it's very much about whether that power holder, you can move them, you can tell a story that they engage with, you can connect with them emotionally and not demonising them but you're challenging them to say I'm sure it's difficult in the job that you're in but I'm sure you also want to do the best job you can and this is a bit of a no-brainer that you should pay people to be able to live in a dignified way. We wrapped and ribboned them up beautifully, these are two of our craftivists which is now three, because that little bump is now a human being. <laughs> and we went to the AGM and hand-delivered them. And the chief, the head of the board, um, the chair of the board, mentioned our campaign in the beginning of the AGM, was really moved. They all spoke to us afterwards and said, we would not be talking to you if you were outside screaming at us with placards. And over 10 months, we had meetings with them, which they hadn't had before with Share Action and the Living Wage Foundation. And they kept coming back to how they shared their hanky with their kids or how one of them was in the archives of Marks and Spencers and really did engage with us. And within 10 months, they'd increased their wages for 50,000 of their staff to be on level with the living wage. And the chair of the board said it wouldn't have been on their agenda, the living wage, never mind at the top of the agenda. And now we're campaigning very quietly um, to get them to become accredited living wage employers. So... That's one different way that you can engage power holders that I think is important, giving them gifts. Other quick ones are you can make something that then turns into a group physical, beautiful um, creation. So we make jigsaw pieces. We did for Save the Children for the IF campaign when the G8 was hosted in the UK. And we said, how can you be a piece of the solution to world hunger? Um, and so we asked people to make a jigsaw for themselves to keep about challenging themselves in this big complicated um, issue where there's no one single answer. We asked them to make a jigsaw for the MP to say how are you going to be a piece of the solution so the MP couldn't cut and paste an answer to everyone or just get a petition that everyone else was giving them. It was a very, it jolted them and then they really enjoyed getting these unique um, jigsaw pieces and then a piece for an installation that then still tours the country. Schools sometimes order them in and put them in their corridors for students to walk past and read. So all unique messages but all around how do we be part of the solution and again it's also challenging that thing of I will save the world, the messiah complex that is awful. We had people who would come to Everton and say we will give you shoes for school and when I was a kid if I wore secondhand shoes I would be bullied massively so it was not helpful having people fly in saying we will save you. So very much not fueling the individualistic I will save the world but seeing yourself as a major part in a collective of many people which is what other speakers have talked about. Also most activism is not intriguing it's often telling us exactly what to think, which actually stops deep engagement. Because if you see something saying, no fracking, that's great for media, that's great for specific issues, it's great for um, specific times that we need to show that there's support. But we also need to intrigue people. And if, if the fracking message is only no fracking, all we do as humans is go, oh, right, I agree with that. Or, oh, right, I don't agree with that. And then you go off onto the world and don't think about it. So we need messages that intrigue people, that don't patronise or preach, but they do provoke and linger in people. So this one is in Somerset House during London Fashion Week in September. So very specific time, very specific context that it's in, targeting fashionistas, targeting people that work in fashion and saying lowest paid models at London Fashion Week get paid 125 quid an hour majority of garment workers in Vietnam get paid £25 a month. And I picked this because it's not saying one's right or the other. 
it's saying this is a fact. Sadly, it's still, um, it's still the same fact, I think. But it is saying, hang on a minute, what's this all about? Is this equal? Maybe it is because models are freelance. I'm freelance, so you do need to be paid more an hour because you don't get paid every hour. Maybe it's an issue because it's cheaper to live in Vietnam. But it gets people thinking and going, what's that telling me to do? Because we either we expect things to be told, we expect to be told what to do, especially in politics. So when you're not told, it's asking you, what do you think? Do you think this is right? Do you think this is wrong? In this case, I put a badge up to a campaign with War on Want, so you could find out more information, and a little label saying Craftivist Collective. So never overwhelm people to go, I don't know what to do about that. Always planting little seeds for potential ways they could find out more, but that balance of provoking, not preaching. And the second one um, doesn't need to be a fact. As we just learned, we need to connect with people's emotions as well, but in a non-judgmental way. So this is the bottom end of Whitechapel where you've got a massive Muslim community, and I did it when the Charlie Hebron incident happened, and there was a lot of tension. I used to live that side of Brick Lane. So I put, me and my dad came up with this quote, if our lives are ruled by fear, we make innocent people our enemies. If our lives are ruled by love, we can make strangers our friends. And again, it's lowercase, it's not capital letters, so it's not shouting at people, it's positive colours, it's overly kitsch, it's small, not big, it's off eye level, so it's naturally very humble rather than claiming um, fame. There's hearts to link in with the issue. But sadly, this is still, and I think will always be relevant. So in terms of longevity, it's also, can you take a really good picture for social media? Can you take a good picture for the media? And can you engage lots of different audiences with this one tiny bit of craft? Still with me? We're nearly there. Quick one is you can do craftivism with young people. I, get lo I focus on adults because they're more influential. So I'm not giving up on the adults. I get a lot of people saying, you should do this with kids. And I do, but I also know that charities do amazing work in schools. And I want to target certain areas of human beings that have a lot of influence. But you can do craftivism with kids who are over seven because of dexterity issues. And again, kids don't always want to do something that's fast and easy. You know, do a need, literally do a needlework with them. I had a group at a festival where we had 40 kids from the age of seven to about 13. And there was silence in the room and I forced the parents to stay because it was not a daycare. And the parents were literally <laughs> like, oh my word, can we do this at home? It's nice and quiet. And the kids, what's good with kids is pester power. So the kids often, we learned about what solidarity means in terms of the person being bullied in their playground. You don't just give them money if their money's being taken off them for school lunch because that's emergency relief. But to be in solidarity means also looking at the root causes and how to support the bully as well as the person being bullied. But also, how do you have solidarity with the person making your breakfast? Solidarity with the banana farmers? Or so really having these big questions and conversations with really thoughtful young people. And then I asked them to do s use their um, solidarity bunting wherever they wanted, put it up in their bedroom, have it up in school, wear it like some of them as necklaces or belts, because some of them are so tiny, it was like a little belt. And it, across the festival, you saw lots of parents who were obviously forced to wear the solidarity as an armband or as a necklace. And the conversations I had with the parents were amazing, because a lot of them were like, I forgot what solidarity meant. I give my money to charity every month to do emergency relief or I sign this petition, but I don't think about all of the different ways I can do solidarity. So it was a good way to sort of engage multiple groups. This morning, we made hearts for your sleeves. And the thing about wearable activism, if you wear something that's homemade, people find it really interesting. If there's a few wobbles in there, it makes it more endearing. We wear hearts on your sleeve, so it's on your arm, like this one, or it's on your wrist. And even people on the bus will say, what's all that about? Why have you got bluebells written in a green heart? Why is it not a red heart? Why is it bluebells? Did you make that? It looks like it's made. And because it's a positive campaign that links in with the Climate Coalition, I can say, oh, it's part of this Climate co coalition campaign where we think about what do we love and how sadly climate change will affect it. Um, so it might be 
affect human beings. It might affect bluebells because they're very sensitive to change in climate. And then we can say, what do you love? And then have a conversation about climate change where you might not often have a conversations about climate change. And the same with when you're stitching all of our kits. People can do it on the bus or the train or in their lunch break. And people can say, what are you doing? And because they've asked the question, they're much more open to hear the answer because you're not forcing it on them. So you can say, I'm doing this mini banner about inequality. What do you think? Where should it go? So you're having these conversations. I've had them with ex-bankers, with single mums, with a huge variety of people that are intimate conversations. Often we challenge each other a lot, but in a loving way. Um, so I've just done a virtual school of gentle protest. It's not just craftivism. It's things like, how do you have a tough conversation with your friends that's just said something really xenophobic or really homophobic? How do you have those conversations are just as much of a craft and an art form as your little heart, but your heart is a good catalyst for change. So it's not about it being the conclusion, because sadly it won't fix the world. But having people wear their hearts, I did an event with Ben and Jerry's where we had over 500 people who we specifically targeted who were nervous of climate marches before the Paris um, COP in December, we said, come along to the rich mix, make your heart, um, colour in your placards, help colour in a giant banner, we'll give you free ice cream um, if you want it, but also challenge Ben and Jerry's about dairy and veganism as well, which was good. And what was great is because people had invested in their hearts, spent time, it wasn't easy to do, so they really felt proud of what they'd made. They had often many of them had the courage to go to a march that they wouldn't have gone to before. And they could see, I told the group this morning, they could see hearts on people's sleeves and go, oh, look at that one over there, look at that. So they felt this real um, part of a bigger call and, and a collective, where I think if they, well, many of them told me if they hadn't made their heart, they would have gone, oh, I can't go today. But their heart gave them that courage to say, I've spent a long time on this heart, I'm going to go, I'm going to wear it, and I'm going to look at who else has made hearts so I can feel an affinity with them. So very much targeting people who had never gone on a march before, which is quite important. And the last one is an example that I'm telling you is you can shop drop instead of shoplift. Not encouraging shoplifting. So one thing we do, and it doesn't have to be hand sewing, is you can do paper craft. Um, and this is, again, linking in with a charity, so you don't have to create everything on your own, but you can work with credible charities that have really good policy in place and ask the right questions. So everyone's not just drawn to you and you can't, you know, you could become burnt out if everyone just asks you the questions. Is you do little mini fashion statements and you put them in shops of unethical fashion shops or fast fashion shops. So you're targeting the audience um, that care about fashion, that love fashion, but have a tendency to buy cheap clothes because they love buying clothes, but often they end up in landfills because they don't last that long. I used to work for Oxfam where we had a zero waste policy. So anything that went into our stores, um, I was in the campaigns team, but anything that went into our Oxfam charity shops, we had to, they couldn't go in the bin if they didn't sell. So it actually cost us more money as a charity to get, um, to get Primark clothes in because we couldn't sell them because no one wanted to buy them, they didn't last, so we had to find ways to recycle them. So we do need to target people that do fast fashion, as well as the big companies, let's target people on the ground. And instead of doing it by demonising people, I love fashion and activism. I've been part of activism groups where they I'll carry Vogue because it's one of my guilty pleasures every month. And they'll say, you can't be an activist and like fashion. So we're stopping people from becoming activists, which is ridiculous. So in your neatest handwriting, I have three different messages that, again, have that balance between not telling people what to do, not judging them, intriguing them, positive, but also being very aware of the negative in the fashion industry that we need to improve, and then linking to fashion revolution so they can do more once they found it. And you put, please open me, with a very important element, which is a smiley face and a kiss. And it's lowercase, and it's in your prettiest handwriting that's curly, not spiky. And handwriting um, means that our brains actually have to read it slower, because your brain that doesn't know a font reads it slower. If we did this all in Times New Roman, your brain just skips through the letters because it's used to it. So again, it slows people down without them even noticing. 
because it's not telling them what to do, but it is a story, so often it's what's the story of this item of clothing. Is it a joyful one or is it a harmful one? There's three different messages. So for the maker, you have to slow down and write it. You have to do it in your neatest writing because you want someone to enjoy the process of unraveling it. And throughout all of the craftivism projects, it's all about connecting to two senses or more. Because if you connect to two or more senses, again, you're more ex it's more experiential. So it's not just clicking online and do it. You remember what you've made, you've invested in it. You can remember smelling the paper, the touch we use dimply paper with embossed scissors in. All of the ribbon is very luxury colours, so it feels more luxurious than something quick and cheap like standard paper and neon colours. So it's very much about thinking about craftivism as a craft and all of the different elements. But at the end of the day, it's about encouraging people to be the best global citizens they can be and giving them the ownership to do it. Because once people decide to find out more for themselves or to change something, they're more likely to stick to that habit. Or if you're encouraging people in positions of power to say, I believe you can be better than this actually rather than you're all awful. It's like when a loved one says, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. <laughs> it's so much more powerful, isn't it, than saying, you're wrong, I'm right, let's fix this. And that's the power of gentle protest. It's loving. If we want the world to be beautiful, kind and just, I think our activism should be beautiful, kind and just, otherwise we discredit ourselves. So they're the things... And it also means this gentle form of protest, so the talk's called The Art of Gentle Protest, means that we reach out to bigger audiences. The Craftivist Collective now has people all over the world, some groups, some people on their own, mostly people who've given up on activism or have never done any activism. We get into publications where activism is not discussed, whether it's fashion magazines or craft books as a project to do. So there is no point in preaching to the converted, especially in, in a world that's becoming more siloed, whether we like it or not. And this kitsch, cute, potentially looking naive or overly lovely way is actually a powerful way to get us all to challenge ourselves and challenge others, but in a respectful, loving way, which is surely what we want the world to be. Thank you very much. That was obviously brilliant. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, um, I was thinking, we haven't got time for questions, but given that was so brilliant, if you, uh, what's the best way of showing a friend that, about what you've just said? Like, is there, have you got talks on YouTube or anything? Everything, or? yeah, I've got four different TEDx talks about different elements, lots on the website, we're on Twitter and Instagram, we've got the kits. <laughs> da, 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 da. But it is about saying to people, have a go, <laughs> even if you don't love craft, especially if you don't love craft, it's actually better if you don't love craft. <laughs> you don't need to know how to craft, I learned from YouTube, all the kits have got everything, YouTube does exist, Google exists, you got no excuse, have a go, see what works for you, see what conversations it creates, see what critical thoughts it creates and um, you can do this now so you got no excuse <laughs> thank you very much <laughs>